thank you, and I'll uh, uh, take advantage of presentations before me to uh, at least elaborate some of the points that I uh, would otherwise make. Uh, first, uh, just let me start off by saying that clearly low carbon development is a very catch-all phrase, very large concept, as I can't really uh, cover that much ground. Uh, I'll just say that, uh, to my mind, when we speak of low carbon development, we are really looking not just at isolated examples of this technology or that, but at systemic transformation uh, and development strategies towards such uh, transformation, which would involve not just doing things differently, but doing very different uh, things. Some of these are very long term, maybe just dreams uh, at the moment. Uh, and some involve broad trajectories and policy frameworks, but I believe that there are some models or at least exemplars uh, available uh, with us. Uh, I want to look at two broad aspects. Centrally, uh, issue of rural industrialization, Amer and uh, Chanakya touched on this earlier, the problem of large population in rural areas today, mostly in poverty, with a declining um, potential for employment in agriculture, and if populations shift to urban areas or to industries, the problem of jobless growth there. So if you don't have jobs in agriculture, you don't have jobs in industry or urban areas, where are these jobs going to come from? Uh, and I think this requires addressing the issue of rural industrialization uh, in a specific new way, which also, I believe, addresses the issue of uh, low carbon uh, development. Uh, an issue which has been very little addressed, I think, is the nature of these rural enterprises. Uh, something like about 30 million odd rural non-farm enterprises exist today. And the interesting thing is, this is not addressed in, to best of my knowledge, any government report or study, is what is the energy requirement for these uh, rural industries. And I've just shown here in this slide an example of rural jaggery making uh, systems. The slide on the left shows you the crusher, which is used to extract the juice from the cane, which is clearly motor energy, usually electricity driven. But of course, in rural areas, you don't have electricity, so they are driven by a DG uh, set. And on the right, you have the pans which are converting the cane juice into jaggery using the bagasse, and that's thermal uh, energy. So it's either thermal or electromechanical energy, neither of which is really being uh, accounted for. That's jaggery, for those who don't know what it is. Uh, and I believe that this is uh, crucial for bridging the urban-rural divide, the same issue of rural uh, industries. But ironically, the poor rural entrepreneur is the person who ends up paying the highest price for energy because he's using a DG set and ends up paying about seven to seven and a half rupees per unit uh, for the energy that he uh, uses. So we've in fact uh, developed a energy efficient system for making jaggery. Uh, our friends in Astra and their colleagues at Tide have worked on the single pan systems prevalent in Karnataka. We have worked on the three pan systems more prevalent in uh, northern India. The slide on the left shows you an improved uh, geometry, which you can see in the sketch on the right corner, shows you the old one and the new geometry that we've done. And the uh, slide below shows you an improvement of about 22% in the fuel efficiency in uh, making these systems. And that means you're saving the bagasse, saving them from being burnt, and then using the bagasse to generate more income for the rural jaggery maker. In the systems that we've installed, the average small rural jaggery unit is able to save about one lakh rupees per season, per year, in the amount of bagasse that is uh, saved. Uh, the government has just launched a very large program of rural industrialization called the National Rural Livelihoods Mission. Huge target, again, uh, of a large number of rural micro enterprises, but again, no estimation of where the energy for this is going to uh, come from. My back of the envelope calculation says it's going to require at least about nine gigawatts uh, to meet just this target, assuming 
a very small amount of 5 to 7.5 kVA connected load in these uh, rural enterprises. <coughs> I think this issue is also linked to a larger issue in the climate debate, again, very little addressed, is the problem of urbanization itself. Uh, usually we talk about urbanization, the impacts of it in climate change, but I think we, are, we take it as a faith accompli. This amount of urbanization is going to happen. What are we therefore going to do about once it has happened? But can't we do something to check the rates of urbanization is, I think, a very important uh, issue to be addressed from the point of view of low carbon uh, development. And uh, one of the things that I'm suggesting is the more we address the issue of rural industrialization, the better we are able to look at the problem of urbanization, which some studies in China suggest may have contributed to as much as 40% rise in greenhouse gas uh, generation, just urbanization alone. Um, So I'll just give you some rapidly, a few examples of rural industries, which I think address these twin uh, issues. Uh, perspectives on this are outlined in this slide. Uh, since they're going to be distributed, I won't touch them. I'd just like to focus on the last two uh, examples. Of course, they're designed to create jobs, to address uh, adverse terms of trade between town and country, but also offer an alternative pattern of uh, pro-poor development. Uh, focusing on localization of production and distribution rather than the globalized models that we are so uh, used to, and simultaneously save enormously on transport uh, energy, uh, save in by reducing urbanization, and are low entropy systems contributing to an overall low carbon uh, strategy. And uh, I'll just give you a few examples of these, each of which uh, are small rural enterprises, but taken at a system as a whole, I think address very large economic issues uh, in the country, apart from the employment uh, potential. They are uh, essentially based, if you look at that small schematic diagram on the right, looking not at small is beautiful isolated systems, but at networked uh, systems which aggregate uh, production functions at different tiers of production and thereby make up larger systems uh, built up through networking of smaller uh, systems. And I'll give you some example. Many of our friends here are familiar with our work in leather, so I'll very quickly go through this. In leather tanning, as we know, these are based on fallen animals uh, with skins being removed from animals that die a natural death in the villages, which end up then in faraway places in tanneries in Madras or Calcutta, traveling 2,000 odd uh, kilometers coming back to the village as footwear or leather and so on, whereas this used to be a differently short-circuited kind of production system. We're going back to that using uh, technologies in tanning, uh, in improving the quality of the leather through uh, innovations in machinery and in processes, uh, and then converting them to products. An interesting angle is this, uh, is that we are using the carcasses of dead cattle, which are normally left for carrion in the villages and converting those into useful uh, products, essentially by cooking the carcass in a large autoclave, which you'll see on the left, uh, which produces the flesh, which is dried and minced, converted into meat meal. The crusher on the right, you see, powders the bone to make bone meal, and the bone meal and meat meal are used either as poultry feed supplements or as uh, manure. And by the way, uh, this also solves the BSE problem uh, associated with animal feeds because the cooking is done at about 140 degrees uh, Celsius, which knocks out that issue. And then it's, you sieve the powders for uh, as per customer requirement. Similarly, this is in the processing of fruits, vegetables, and edible non-timber forest produce through a similar decentralized and networked uh, systems. These are FPO grade uh, production systems, not homemade kitchen scale um, enterprises. They involve, again, decentralized operations. The best example I can give you is of raw mango pickles, which are common in this part of the country, where the woman in the small farmer household doesn't just sell the raw mango, but chops it and uh, adds powders, chili powders, and sells it. And 
It's centralized uh, bottling and pickling is done subsequently. These are branded, as you can see, and that's the brand that we have done. Marketed, again, in local or nearby uh, areas. Pottery, which, as you know, is characterized by drudgery and dwindling markets. New technologies for this. To upgrade local uh, clay, which normally vitrifies at 800-odd uh, degrees, can now be fired at about 10, 000, uh, 1,000 or 1,100. I'll just draw your attention to the LPG kiln that you see there, which substitutes for the wood-fired kilns you normally see in potters, and which are now increasingly finding use in urban areas, including in the Dharavi slums uh, in Bombay. Uh, we are currently working in the field of non-edible oils, where neem is the most well-known oil, but only 10% even of neem is being actually used in soap and other industries. We are working on generic technologies addressing a large range of tree-borne uh, oils, some of which are shown uh, here. Uh, and this is a generic technology package. What is interesting about this is if you go to the industry and say, I want an oil processing set of machinery, they'll say, OK, you want to do neem, I'll give you a set of machines for neem. Then you say, no, I want to do uh, pongamia also. And they say, OK, we'll give you a machine for pongamia. Whereas in the villages, you have a range of machines. So the, what you see on top there is a decorticator, which separates the kernel from the shell. And this is a generic multiple seed decorticator, which can handle seeds ranging from 4 millimeters to 20 millimeters uh, in diameter. It just It's a modular design, so it can be quickly shifted around in a matter of a few hours. And then you have the expellers. The hammer mill is for heavier seeds like almond or wild apricot uh, and stuff like that. Again, this works through this network system where at the village level you do primary production, the removal of kernel. The kernels are then brought to a centralized location, converted to the oil, and further treated and uh, so on. We are doing this in about 10 different locations in the country where pilot plants have been set up, and now commercialization is uh, underway. And we are also working in our own field area in Dehradun, covering four districts, which is a fairly large catchment area, potentially with 100,000 tons of wild apricot per annum. And we are now looking to develop models to scale up these kinds of rural enterprises uh, in quantity as well as in quality and integrating them with the value chain, both domestically as well as uh, globally where these products uh, operate. I'll close by posing the question that in these kinds of technology systems uh, that we are talking about, uh, what I would see is that these are not, as you can see, linear. Uh, don't convey a linear idea of uh, progress, of what constitutes good or bad, small or big. But you're trying to achieve a uh, developmental system which is more employment oriented, may in the small local area consume more energy than what they were doing traditionally because it's more mechanized, but in the larger picture, consumes less energy, is responsible for less carbon, and is a lower entropy system. The best example of the low entropy that I can give you is in our fruit products, for example. We are sitting in Himachal Pradesh, which grows apples. Right there in Himachal, in Kullu, where we are sitting, you get the tetra pack of apple juice, which comes from Bombay or wherever, selling right there where the growers are growing apples, which is, of course, 80% by weight is water, transported to some faraway place, gets processed and come all the way back. We have a famous brand of orange juice in this country, which is made from spray-dried powder uh, orange juice, which is extracted in Florida, spray-dried, converted to powder, shipped to Nepal, water is added, reconstituted as orange juice, packed in tetra packs, and sold in this country. Uh, I can't think of a higher entropy system uh, than that. So the issue that I'd like to pose is the kind of developmental system that we are looking at is the pattern, uh, what it is that we are trying to look for and do, and how we define progress in some sense. The best uh, example I can give is from uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss in his famous radio interviews with uh, Guy Charbonnier, uh, was asked about the 
difference between primitive societies and advanced societies and so on and said, can you compare and say which one is better? And he said, uh, it's like asking an engineer to compare clocks with steam engines and saying which is a better machine. Uh, thermodynamically, if you look at it, a clock produces very little mechanical work, but does that with uh, very low entropy, high efficiency, but little output. A steam engine, on the other hand, high amount of mechanical work, but high entropy. Uh, so what it is, what is it exactly that we are uh, looking for? Uh, and I think the kinds of examples I give uh, for low entropy systems probably look for uh, machines that work more like clocks, but not all clocks are the same. And uh, a clock for the modern uh, era is, I think, what we are looking for. Thank you very much.